7. The international outlook 1. When I compare the aftermaths of the two wars, I see a number of obvious resemblances, but one outstanding difference. Last time, we believed that the war of 1914-18 had been a terrible but nevertheless non-significant interruption in the course of reasonable civilized historical progress. We thought of it as an accident like a railway collision or an earthquake, and we imagined that, as soon as we had buried the dead and cleared up the wreckage, we could go back to living the comfortable uneventful life which, at that time, had come to be taken for granted. As though it were the birthright of man, by that small and exceptionally privileged fraction of the living generation of mankind that was represented by people of the middle class in the democratic industrial western countries. This time, by contrast, we are well aware that the end of hostilities is not the end of the story. What is the issue that is arousing this anxiety today all over the world, among the Americans, the Canadians, our all this paper is based on a lecture delivered on May 22, 1947, in London at Chatham House, on return from a visit to the United States and Canada between February 8 and Z April 6, 1947. Selves, our European neighbors, and the Russians, for, from the glimpse of the Russians that I had at Paris this last summer, I should say that we can gauge the Russians' feelings pretty accurately by analogy with our own? I shall give you my own personal view, which is, as you will see, a controversial one. My personal belief is that this formidable issue is a political issue, not an economic one, and I further believe that it is not the question whether the world is going to be unified politically in the near future. I believe and this is, I suppose, my most controversial assertion, but I am simply stating what I do sincerely think I believe it is a foregone conclusion that the world is in any event going to be unified politically in the near future. If you consider just two things, the degree of our present interdependence and the deadliness of our present weapons, and put these two considerations together, I do not see how you can arrive at any other conclusion. I think the big and really formidable political issue today is, not whether the world is soon going to be unified politically, but in which of two alternative possible ways this rapid unification is going to come about. There is the old-fashioned and unpleasantly familiar way of continual rounds of wars going on to a bitter end at which one surviving great power knocks out its last remaining competitor and imposes peace on the world by conquest. This is the way in which the Greco-Roman world was forcibly united by Rome in the last century BC, and the Far Eastern world in the 3rd century BC. By the Roman-minded principality of Tizin. And then there is the new experiment in a cooperative government of the world no, not quite a new one, because there were abortive attempts at finding a cooperative way out of the troubles that were actually brought to an end by the forcible imposition of the Pax Romance and the Pax Sinica, but our own pursuit, in our own lifetime, of this happier solution has been so much more resolute and so much more self-conscious that we may perhaps fairly regard it as a new departure. Our first attempt at it was the League of Nations, our second attempt is the United Nations Organization. It is evident that we are engaged here on a very difficult political pioneering enterprise over largely unknown ground. If this enterprise did succeed even if only just so far as to save us from a repetition of the knockout blow it might open out quite new prospects for mankind, prospects that we have never sighted before during these last five or six thousand years that have seen us maltying a number of attempts at civilization. After greeting this gleam of hope on our horizon we should be sinking into a fool's paradise if we did not also take note of the length and the roughness of the road that lies between our goal and the point at which we stand to. Day. We are not likely to succeed in averting the knockout blow unless we take due account of the circumstances that unfortunately tell in favor of it. The first of these adverse circumstances, with which we have to contend, is the fact that, within the span of a single lifetime, the number of great powers of the highest material caliber if we measure this caliber in terms of sheer war potential has dwindled from 8 to 2. Today, in the arena of naked power politics, the United States and the Soviet Union face one another alone. One more world war, 
and there might be only a solitary great power left to give the world its political unity by the old-fashioned method of the conqueror imposing his fiat. This startlingly rapid fall in the number of great powers of the highest material caliber has been due to a sudden jump in the material scale of life, which has dwarfed powers of the dimensions of Great Britain and France by comparison with powers of the dimensions of the Soviet Union and the United States. Such sudden jumps have occurred before in history. Between five and four hundred years ago, powers of the dimensions of Venice and Florence were similarly dwarfed by the sudden emergence of powers of the dimensions of England and France. This dwarfing of the European powers by the United States and the Soviet Union would have happened, no doubt, in any case in course of time. It is, I should say, an inevitable ultimate consequence of the recent opening up of the vast spaces of North America and Russia, and of the still more recent development of their resources by the application there, on a massive scale, of technical methods partly invented in the laboratories of Western Europe. But the time taken by this inevitable process might have been as much as a hundred years if it had not been telescoped into a third or a quarter of that span by the cumulative effect of two world wars. If the change had not been thus accelerated, it would have been a gradual process that me GHT have allowed all parties time to adjust themselves to it more or less painlessly. As a result of its having been speeded up by the two wars, it has been a revolutionary process which has put all parties in a quandary. It is important for European observers to realize, as one does realize when he has been watching the reactions in the United States at first hand, that this speeding up of the transfer of material power from the older powers of the inner ring in Europe to the younger powers of the outer ring in America and Asia is as awkward for the Americans as it is for ourselves. The Americans are homesick for their comparatively carefree 19th century past. At the same time, they realize, far more clearly, and also far more generally, than either they or we realized after the war of 1914-18, that it is impossible to put the clock back to a comfortable pre-war hour. They know that they have got to stay out in the world now, however much they may dislike the bleakness of the prospect. They are facing this unwelcome new chapter in their history with an unenthusiastic confidence when they think of it in terms of the technical and economic jobs that they will be called upon to do in Greece and Turkey and in other foreign countries that, as the president warned them, may follow. But they express something like dismay when they are reminded that man does not live by bread alone, and that they will have to take a hand in politics as well as economics. If they are to succeed in acclimatizing democracy, in the Western meaning of the term, in non-Western countries where they are intervening for this purpose. Screen the political prisoners in Ruritania, and see to it that the Ruritanian government releases those who ought to be at liberty. Secure the transformation of the Ruritanian police. From an agency for twisting the arms of the political opponents of the partisan government of the day into an agency for protecting the liberties of the subject. Bring about a corresponding reform of the Ruritanian courts of justice. If you suggest to Americans today that, when once they have implicated themselves in Ruritania, they will find it impossible to leave these political enterprises unattempted, they are apt to exclaim that the United States does not command the personnel for handling jobs of this kind abroad. This uneasiness about incurring political responsibilities in politically backward foreign countries has aroused, in American minds, a sudden concern about the future of the British Empire. This concern, like most human feelings on most occasions, is, I should say, partly self-regarding and partly disinterested. The self-regarding consideration in American minds is the prospect that, if the British Empire were to disintegrate, it would leave a huge political vacuum far larger and more perilous than the no-man's land in Greece and Turkey into which the United States might find herself constrained to step in order to forestall the Soviet Union. The Americans have become alive to the convenience, for them, of the British Empire's existence just at the moment when, as they see it, the British Empire is being liquidated. But this recently aroused American concern for the Empire is also largely disinterested and warm-hearted. The traditional American denunciation of British imperialism went hand in hand, I fancy, with an unconscious assumption that this British Empire was, 
for good or evil, one of the world's established and abiding institutions. Now that the Americans really believe that the empire is in its death agony, they are beginning to regret the imminent disappearance of so prominent and familiar an object in their political landscape, and are becoming conscious of services performed by the empire for the world, which they did not value and hardly noticed. So long as they could take the continuance of those services for granted. This abrupt change in the American attitude towards the British Empire during the winter of 1946-7 was the consequence of American interpretations of current events. At that time, two facts were striking the American imagination, the physical sufferings of the people of Great Britain, and the definite decision of the government of the United Kingdom to withdraw from India in 1948. Taken together, these two facts made on American minds the impression. minds is the prospect that, if the British Empire were to disintegrate, it would leave a huge political vacuum far larger and more perilous than the no man's land in Greece and Turkey into which the United States might find herself constrained to step in order to forestall the Soviet Union. The Americans have become alive to the convenience, for them, of the British Empire's existence just at the moment when, as they see it, the British Empire is being liquidated. But this recently aroused American concern for the empire is also largely disinterested and warm-hearted. The traditional American denunciation of British imperialism went hand in hand, I fancy, with an unconscious assumption that this British empire was, for good or evil, one of the world's established and abiding institutions. Now that the Americans really believe that the empire is in its death agony, they are beginning to regret the imminent disappearance of so prominent and familiar an object in their political landscape, and are becoming conscious of services performed by the empire for the world, which they did not value and hardly noticed. So long as they could take the continuance of those services for granted. This abrupt change in the American attitude towards the British Empire during the winter of 1946-7 was the consequence of American interpretations of current events. At that time, two facts were striking the American imagination, the physical sufferings of the people of Great Britain, and the definite decision of the government of the United Kingdom to withdraw from India in 1948. Taken together, these two facts made on American minds the impression that the British Empire was down and out, and, in their sensational way, American commentators telescoped into a single instantaneous event the whole evolution of the British Empire since 1783, and at the same time assumed that the change had been wholly involuntary. As most Americans saw it, the United Kingdom had suddenly become too weak to hold the empire by force any longer, few of them appeared to realize that the British people had learned a tremendous lesson from the loss of the 13 colonies and had been trying to apply that lesson ever since. In uninstructed American minds, the impression was that the empire of King George III had existed practically unchanged till yesterday and was suddenly crumbling today, and, however wide of the market may seem to us to be, this American notion is not really so surprising as it must sound to British ears. On matters which do not happen to come within the range of our adult experience, all of us are apt to retain uncriticized and unrevised, the crude and simple-minded conceptions that were suggested to us in childhood. There is, for instance, or used to be till lately, a British schoolboy legend that the French have no capacity for governing dependencies or handling backward peoples. The average American's notion of the British Empire is similarly based on the legend of the Revolutionary War that he learned at school, and not on any first-hand grown-up observation of present facts. Many Americans, for instance, show ignorance even of the present status of Canada, though they themselves may be in constant personal contact with Canadians and, if they are, 
will have recognized them instinctively as being upstanding free people of the same kind as the Americans themselves. Yet, so far from putting two and two together and looking into the facts afresh, it is as likely as not that they will have gone on imagining that Canada in their time is still being ruled from Downing Street and is paying taxes which she never paid to the Treasury in Whitehall. This explains in large measure why both the speed and the character of the change that has taken place in the constitution of the British Empire have been misconceived by many American minds. Yet, when all due correction of such misconceptions has been made, the British critic has, in his turn, to face the fact that, in the power of the empire, as distinct from its constitution, a change has taken place that has been not only very great but also very rapid. The truth is that in terms of pure power politics of sheer war potential there are now only two great powers left confronting one another, the United States and the Soviet Union. The recognition of this fact in the United States explains the heart-searching caused by the announcement of the Truman Doctrine. Americans realize that this is a turning point in American history for two reasons. In the first place, it brings the United States right out of her traditional isolation, and in the second place the president's move might turn out however far this may have been from his intention to have given the whole course of international affairs an impulsion away from the new cooperative method of trying to achieve political world unity, and towards the old-fashioned method of fighting out the last round in the struggle of power politics and arriving at the political unification of the world by the main force of a knockout blow. Having now reviewed the circumstances that tell in favor of this old-fashioned solution, we must arouse our selves to get the better of them by reminding ourselves how utterly disastrous a knockout blow would be. It would condemn mankind to go through at least one more world war. A third world war would be fought with atomic and other perhaps not less deadly new weapons. Moreover, in previous cases for example, the forcible unification of the Chinese world by the principality of Tizin, and of the Greco-Roman world by Rome the achievement of a long overdue political unification through a knockout blow has been purchased at the prohibitive price of inflicting mortal wounds on the society that has had unity imposed upon it by this extreme resort to force. If we thought of these wounds in material terms, and tried to estimate the capacity of different civilizations for reconstruction as well as destruction, it might not be easy to draw up strictly comparable balance sheets for our modern Western civilization on the one hand and for the Greco-Roman and Chinese civilizations on the other. No doubt we have a far greater capacity to reconstruct as well as to destroy than the Chinese and the Romans had. On the other hand, a simpler social structure has a far greater spontaneous recuperative power than a more complicated one has. When I see our rebuilding program in Great Britain being retarded by shortages of skilled labor and of highly processed materials, and perhaps not least by the mere complication of the administrative ma Chine, my mind goes back to a glimpse that I had in 1923 of a Turkish village reconstructing itself after it had been devastated in the last phase of the Greco Turkish War of AD. 1919 to 22 those Turkish villagers were not dependent on materials or labor from outside, and they were not at the mercy of red tape. They were rebuilding their houses and replacing their household utensils and agricultural implements with their own hands, out of wood and clay within their reach. Who can estimate whether New York, after a Third World War, would fare materially as well as Yen Ike after 1922 or as badly as Carthage after 146 B.C.P. The self-inflicted wounds from which civilizations die are not, however, those of a material order. In the past, at any rate, it has been the spiritual wounds that have proved incurable, and since, beneath all the variety of cultures, there is uniformity in man's spiritual nature, we may guess that the spiritual devastation produced by a knockout blow is of about the same deadly degree of severity in every case. Yet, if the coercive method of attaining political world unity is immeasurably disastrous, the cooperative method, on its side, bristles with difficulties. At the present moment, for example, we can see the great powers trying perhaps unavoidably to do at the same time two things which are not only different but which militate against one another all the time and are quite incompatible in the long run. 
They are trying to launch a new system of cooperative world government without being able to forecast its chances of success, and they are safeguarding themselves against the possibility of its being a failure by continuing to maneuver against one. Another, in the old-fashioned way, in a game of power politics which, if persisted in, can only lead to a third world war and a knockout blow. The United Nations organization may fairly be described as a political machine for putting into effect the maximum possible amount of cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union the two great powers who would be the principal antagonists in a final round of naked power politics. The present constitution of the UN represents the closest degree of cooperation that the United States and the Soviet Union can reach at present. This con. Constitution is a very loose confederation, and the presiding genius of Chatham House, Lionel Curtis, has pointed out that political associations of this loose-knit type have never proved stable or lasting in the past. The United Nations organization after the World War of 1939-45 ISI and the same stage as the United States after the War of Independence. In either case, during the war, a strong common fear of a dangerous common enemy held a loose association of states together. The existence of this common enemy was like a life belt keeping the association afloat. When the common enemy has been removed by defeat, the association that was launched on his account has to sink or swim without the unintended but most efficacious aid which the common enemy's existence provided, in such post-war circumstances a loose confederation cannot long remain in its original state, sooner or later it must either break up or be transformed into a genuine and effective federation. A federation, in order to be a lasting success, seems to require a high degree of homogeneity between the constituent states. It is true that in Switzerland and in Canada we see remarkable examples of effective federations that have successfully surmounted formidable differences of language and religion. But would any sober-minded observer today venture to name a date at which a federation between the United States and the Soviet Union might become practical politics, and those are the two states that have to be federated if federal union is to save us from a third world war. Yet these obvious difficulties in the path of the cooperative method of working towards the inevitable goal of world unity must not daunt us, because this method brings with it certain unique benefits that no alternative can offer. It is only if there is some constitutional form of world government that powers can continue to count as great powers and really to play that part in spite of their war potential being no longer a match for the war potential of the Soviet Union and the United States. In an even partially constitutional world community, Great Britain, the continental West European countries, and the Dominions can still have an influence in international councils far in excess of the ratio of their war potential to that of the big two. In an even semi-parliamentary international forum, the political experience, maturity and moderation of countries like these will weigh heavily in the balance alongside of the grosser weight of Brenya's sword. In a pure power politics world, on the other hand, these highly civilized but materially less powerful states will count for nothing compared with the United States and the Soviet Union. In a third world war, all of them except perhaps South Africa, Australia and New Zealand will be battlefields. This will be especially the fate of Great Britain and Canada a prospect of which the Canadians, as well as the English, are well aware. As we look this dangerous situation in the face, some further questions suggest themselves. In politics, unlike personal relations, the saying that two is company, three is none is the very opposite of the truth. Where eight great powers, or even three great powers, can be gathered together, it is less difficult to manage a cooperative government of the world than where we can muster no more than two. This obvious reflection raises the question whether it is possible to call into existence a third great power which could be the peer of the United States and the Soviet Union on all planes, a match for each of them in terms of war potential in the arena of power politics, and their moral and political equal in the International Council Chamber in so far as mankind succeeds in its present political pioneering enterprise of substituting the humane device of constitutional government for the blind play of physical force in the conduct of international relations.
Could this role of a third great power in every sense a role which the United Kingdom, by itself, no longer has the material strength to sustain be filled by the British Commonwealth collectively? The short answer to this question is, I think, on a bare statistical test, yes, on a geographical and political test, no. In the councils of a constitutionally governed world, the state's members of the Commonwealth will carry great weight because they are a large contingent in the small company of states that are politically mature, and also be cause they will be apt to speak with much the same voice not because their policy will have been regimented, concerted, or even coordinated in advance, but because they have vitally important things in common in their political, social, and spiritual traditions and have not ceased to live in unusually close and friendly relations with one another. Since they have moved off on their separate roads towards the goal of self-government. But, in order to transform the Commonwealth into a third great power by making it as powerful collectively as its members are influential in the aggregate, the countries of the Commonwealth would have to weld themselves together into a massive military unity. As highly centralized as the Soviet Union is at all times and as the United States is in time of war, and one has only to state this requirement in order to see that it is quite impracticable. It would mean reversing the direction in which the Commonwealth has been consistently and deliberately moving since 1783, and scrapping cumulative results of this evolution which are the cherished joint achievements of the people of the United Kingdom and the peoples of the other countries in the Commonwealth that have attained self-government, on a PAR with the United Kingdom, in the course of this last century and a half. One cannot have one's cake and eat it. One cannot put one's treasure in progressive devolution aiming at a maximum of self-government in as many parts of the Commonwealth as may display or develop an aptitude for governing themselves, and at the same time expect to command the collective military strength which the government at Moscow to take as an illustration the most pertinent case in point has been consistently and deliberately building up for the last six centuries at the cost of liberty, variety, and other political and spiritual blessings which the Commonwealth countries have secured for themselves at the cost of collective power. The Commonwealth countries cannot repudiate their ideals and unravel the web of history that they have woven for themselves, they would not do this if they could, and, even if they could and would perform this left-handed miracle, they would have thrown away their birthright in vain, for, at however great a sacrifice of the Commonwealth's characteristic virtues and achievements, the Commonwealth could never be consolidated, either politically or geographically, to a degree that would make it a match for the United States or the Soviet Union in military power in terms of atomic war. Fair. In the game of power politics, a consolidated commonwealth would still be a pawn, or at the most a knight, but never a queen. If the British Commonwealth cannot fill the role of third great power in the world after the war of 1939-45, could the part be played by a United States of Europe? This suggestion, too, wears a promising appearance at first sight, but it, in turn, fails to stand the test of examination. Hitler once said that, if Europe seriously wanted to be a power in the world in our time, and by power, of course, Hitler meant brute military strength, then Europe must welcome and embrace the Führer's policy, and this hard saying was surely the truth. Hitler's Europe a Europe forcibly united by German conquest and consolidated under German domination is the only kind of Europe that could conceivably be a match in war potential for either the Soviet Union or the United States, and a Europe united under German ascendancy is utterly abhorrent to all non-German Europeans. Some of them have been subjected to the appalling experience of German conquest and domination twice in one lifetime, most of them have undergone it during the Second World War, and the handful that have escaped have been near enough to the fire and sufficiently scorched by its heat to share the feelings of those who have been burnt outright. In a European Union excluding both the Soviet Union and the United States and that, X hypothesis is the point of departure for trying to construct a European third great power Germany must come to the top sooner or later by one means or another, even if this united Europe were to be presented, at the start, with a Germany that was disarmed and decentralized or even divided. In the wrong that lies between the United States and the Soviet Union, 
Germany occupies a commanding central position, the German nation is half as numerous again as the next most numerous nation in Europe, the German inhabited. Heart of Europe, not reckoning in either Austria or the German-speaking part of Switzerland, contains a preponderant proportion of Europe's total resources in raw materials, plant, and human skill for heavy industry, and the Germans are as efficient in organizing both human and non-human raw materials for making war as they are in. Apt in trying to govern themselves and intolerable as rulers of other people. On whatever terms Germany were to be included, at the start, in a united Europe that did not include either America or Russia, she would become the mistress of such a Europe in the long run, and, even if the supremacy which she has failed to win by force in two wars were to come to her, this time, peacefully and gradually, no non-German European will believe that the Germans, once they realized that this power was within their grasp, would have the wisdom or self-restraint to refrain from plying the whip and digging in the spurs. This German crux would appear to be an insurmountable obstacle to the construction of a European third great power. Nor, in the world as it is today, could a militarily consolidated Europe look forward with any more reasonable hope than a militarily consolidated British Commonwealth to making itself a match for the United States or the Soviet Union at the cost of sacrificing cherished liberties. In Western Europe, especially, and Western Europe is the heart of Europe, the traditions of national individuality are so strong that the closest practicable European Union would be too loosely knit to be more than a pawn in the power game, even if this united Europe included. The British Isles on the west and the countries now under Russian domination on the east, and even if the peoples of Europe as a whole tried their hardest to swallow Hitler's unpalatable gospel. Where, then, are we to find our third great power? If not in Europe and not in the British Commonwealth, then certainly not in China or India, for, in spite of their ancient civilizations and their vast populations, territories, and resources, these two mammoths are most unlikely to prove able to exert their latent strength during the critical period of history that lies, we may guess, immediately ahead of us. We are driven to the conclusion that we cannot hope to ease the tensity of the present international situation by raising the number of powers of the highest military caliber through adding even one to the two that now confront one another. And this leads us to a final question, if we cannot see our way to any rapid attainment of the goal of world unity by constitutional cooperation, can we find some way of postponing the terrible alternative of unification by force? Could two separate political worlds be delimited one under the hegemony of the United States and the other under the domination of the Soviet Union? And, if a demarcation line between them, encircling the globe, could be drawn without bringing the two great powers to blows, could an American world and a Russian world exist side by side, on the face of the same planet, for more than a short time without falling into war with one another, as, under different social and technological traditions, a Roman world and a Chinese world did once coexist for several centuries without war and indeed almost without intercourse of any kind? If we could win time for peace by a provisional recourse to insulation, perhaps the social climates of the political universes on either side of the dividing line might gradually influence one another until they had become like enough to make it possible for the Soviet Union and the United States to enter, in an auspicious hour, into that effective political cooperation with one another that is at present beyond their reach by reason of the ideological and cultural gulf that now divides them. What prospects are there of the United States and the Soviet Union's practicing nonviolent non cooperation towards one another over a span of 30, 50, a hundred years? If a dividing line could be drawn round the world, would that leave elbow room enough for each of them in her own sphere? The answer to our question would be an encouraging one if we could render it in economic terms alone, for each of these giants has ample economic elbow room not only within its own sphere of influence but within its own political frontiers. One of the considerations that drove the rulers of Nazi Germany and contemporary Japan into aggressive war was their inability to provide more than a minority of their young men with jobs that satisfied their expectations, or even with jobs of any kind. By contrast, 
both Russia and America today have openings enough and to spare for the rising generation for as many years as anyone can see ahead. If man were nothing more than economic man, there would be no reason in the world why Russia and America should collide with one another for generations to come. But, unfortunately, man is a political as well as an economic animal. He has to contend not only with want but with fear, and, on the plane of ideas and ideologies, Russia and America cannot so easily avoid crossing each other's path by staying at home and each cultivating her own ample garden. On this plane, the social climates of the two great powers will undoubtedly influence one another, but this mutual influence will not by any means necessarily be pacific in its effect or lead towards reciprocal assimilation, it may ht alternatively produce a thunderstorm or an x. Plosion. Neither the capitalist nor the communist world is immune against subversive influences radiating from the other, for neither of them is the earthly paradise that it claims to be, and they reveal their fears in the measures which each takes to protect itself against the other's radiation. The Iron Curtain with which the Soviet Union attempts to screen off the outer world tells its own tale eloquently. But on the capitalist side there is a corresponding, though less paralysing, fear of communist missionary activity, and, while in democratic countries this fear does not express itself in governmental bans on personal inter course, it does very readily become inflamed into a panic-stricken hysteria. Fear, then, might do what want could hardly do in causing Russia and America to fall foul of one another. But how, it might be asked, could this lead to an outright ordeal by battle between antagonists of such extremely unequal strength? The United States, with her immense superiority in industrial equipment, now capped by her monopoly of the know-how of the manufacture of the atom bomb, is so much stronger than the Soviet Union. That, short of attempting to wrench out of her rival's grip some country upon which the Soviet Union has already fastened its hold, it is apparently possible today for the United States to assert her own protectorate over any country she chooses in the no man's land between the Soviet Union and herself, with little danger of the Soviet Union's attempting to oppose her by overt force. This is illustrated by the impunity with which the United States has been able to spread her aegis over Greece and Turkey, though these two countries lie on the very threshold of the approaches to the Soviet Union's principal granary and arsenal in the Ukraine and the Caucasus. This would mean that the United States has it in her power to draw the demarcation line between an American and a Russian sphere close round the present fringes of the Soviet Union's political domain. That would give the United States the lion's share of a partitioned globe. And this so we might be inclined, on first thoughts, to conclude the argument would augment America's already great preponderance over Russia very notably. This conclusion, however, is one which second thoughts might revise. On such a division of the world, the preponderance of the United States would indeed be overwhelming statistically, but that, after all, is a theoretical and possibly misleading basis of comparison. In political, social, and ideological terms, would the ratio of strength be the same as in terms of area, population, and productivity? Could an American-led three-quarters or four-fifths of the world be so closely united in itself politically, socially, and ideologically as to be impervious to Russian missionary activity? Or, to put this last question the other way round, how far would the majority of the inhabitants of our hypothetical American sphere of influence be likely to be attracted by the present rather conservative American gospel of out-and-out -out individualism? The present American ideology lays great stress on the value of freedom, but seems less keenly alive to the need for social justice. This is not at all surprising in an ideology that is a homegrown product, for, in the United States today, the minimum standard of living is so extraordinarily HIGH that there is not a crying need to curb the freedom of the able, the strong, and the rich in order to deal out a dole of elementary social justice to the incompetent, the weak, and the poor. But the material well-being of the people of the United States is, of course, something ex exceptional in the world as it is today. The overwhelming majority of the living generation of mankind beginning with a foreign-born or foreign-descended underworld in the United States itself, 
and ending with nearly a thousand million Chinese and Indian peasants and coolies is today underprivileged, and is becoming increasingly conscious of its plight, and increasingly restive at it. In an unequally divided planet, the majority of this vast mass of primitive suffering humanity would be on the American side of the line, and to appreciate the utterly un-American problems of this miserable flock would demand an almost superhumanly imaginative and benevolent sympathy on the part of their American shepherds. Here, for the American, would be his Achilles heel, and, for the Russian, his opportunity to sow tears in his adversary's field. To look at the situation through Russian eyes, there might seem, in these circumstances, to be quite a promising prospect of at any rate partly redressing, by propaganda, a balance that had been upset by the American discovery of the know-how of the atom bomb. In a divided world in which the Americans had to fear the effects of Russian propaganda on vast non-American populations under the aegis of the United States, while the Soviet government, on its side, was terrified of the attack which the capitalist way of life might have for any Soviet citizens who came into personal contact with it, the prospects of stability and peace would evidently be unpromising if there were no other factor in the situation. Fortunately a third factor, and a constructive one, would be provided by Great Britain and several of the continental West European countries. In this post-war chapter of history, these West European countries are in an intermediate position between the United States and the overseas dominions of the British Commonwealth on the one hand and the politically and economically backward countries on the other. Post-war conditions in Western Europe are not so bad as to give the desperate remedies prescribed by communism that attraction for Englishmen, Dutchmen, Belgians, and Scandi. Navians that they might have for the flagrantly underprivileged majority of Mexicans, Egyptians, Indians, and Chinese, but Western Europe is at the same time not so prosperous as to be able to afford the undiluted regime of private enterprise that still prevails in North America above the Rio Grande. In these circumstances, Great Britain and her West European neighbors are each trying to arrive at a working compromise suited to their own economic conditions here and now, and subject to modification in either direction as these conditions may change for better or for worse between unrestricted free enterprise and unlimited socialism. If these West European social experiments achieve any measure of success, they may prove a valuable contribution to the welfare of the world as a whole. Not that they could serve as blueprints for automatic application elsewhere, for the different peoples of the world, who have suddenly been brought into close quarters with one another physically through the many inventions of the West, are still divided from one another politically, economically, socially, and psychologically by differences that it will take time to overcome. In a world in this stage of social evolution, a particular local and temporary solution of a worldwide problem cannot be applicable, as it stands, outside the country where it has been worked out by trial and error to fit the local conditions of the moment. But perhaps here we have put our finger on the service which the West European countries can perform for the world today. An awkward feature of the American ideology of free enterprise as well as of the Russian ideology of communism is precisely that it presents a social blueprint as a panacea for every conceivable social ill in every known set of social circumstances. But this does not fit the facts of real life. In real life, every social system that can be observed at first hand or reconstructed from records is a mixed system, lying at some point between the two theoretical poles of undiluted socialism and undiluted free enterprise. The statesman's task is to strike that note in the gamut that tunes in with the particular social circumstances of his time and place, to find the right mixture between free enterprise and socialism for driving his truck of state on the particular gradient on which it happens to be traveling at the moment. What the world needs above all now is to get the issue of free enterprise versus socialism off its ideological pedestal and to treat it, not as a matter of semi-religious faith and fanaticism, but as a common sense, practical question of trial and error, of, more or less, circumstance and adaptation. If Western Europe could influence the rest of the world in this direction in the chapter of history ahead of us, that might be not only a great contribution to prosperity but also a great service to peace. 
it might be one of the influences that would gradually break down the social, cultural, and ideological barriers between the United States and the Soviet Union. But, as has been suggested more than once in this paper, there has to be a minimum of constitutional cooperative government in the world to allow countries of the material caliber of the United Kingdom or the Netherlands to exercise influence in a world society in which, as a result of one of those changes in the scale of material life that overtake us from time to time, the only surviving great powers, in terms of sheer war potential, are giants of the tremendous caliber of the Soviet Union and the United States. Could this West European influence work its beneficent unifying effect in a world unequally divided into an American and a Russian sphere? If it could, this might be a second line to fall back on if our second attempt at cooperative world government were to fail like the first. But it would, of course, be far better if the United Nations organization could be carried through to success, and this, I would suggest to you most earnestly, is the goal towards which we ought still to strive with all our might, without allowing ourselves to be dismayed or deterred by difficult ties, however baffling, at a stage which is, after all, still a very early one in the United Nations career. 8. Civilization on Trial I. Our present Western outlook on history is an extraordinarily contradictory one. While our historical horizon has been expanding vastly in both the space dimension and the time dimension, our historical vision what we actually do see, in contrast to what we now could see if we chose, has been contracting rapidly to the narrow field of what a horse sees between its blinkers or what a U-boat commander sees through his periscope. This is certainly extraordinary, yet it is only one of a number of contradictions of this kind that seem to be characteristic of the times in which we are living. There are other examples that probably loom larger in the minds of most of us. For instance, our world has risen to an unprecedented degree of humanitarian feeling. There is now a recognition of the human rights of people of all classes, nations, and races, yet at the same time we have sunk to perhaps unheard of depths of class warfare, nationalism, and racialism. These bad passions find vent in cold-blooded, scientifically planned cruelties, and the two incompatible states of mind and standards of conduct are to be seen today, side by side, not merely in the same world, but sometimes in the same country and even in the same soul. Again, we now have an unprecedented power of production side by side with unprecedented shortages. We have invented machines to work for us, but have less spare labor than ever before for human service even for such an essential and elementary service as helping mothers to look after their babies. We have persistent alternations of widespread unemployment with famines of manpower. Undoubtedly, the contrast between our expanding historical horizon and our contracting historical vision is something characteristic of our age. Yet, looked at in itself, what an astonishing contradiction it is. Let us remind ourselves first of the recent expansion of our horizon. In space, our western field of vision has expanded to take in the whole of mankind over all the habitable and traversable surface of this planet, and the whole stellar universe in which this planet is an infinitesimally small speck of dust. In time, our western field of vision has expanded to take in all the civilizations that have risen and fallen during these last 6,000 years, the previous history of the human race back to its genesis between 600,000 and a million years ago, the history of life on this planet back to perhaps 800 million years ago. What a marvelous widening of our historical horizon. Yet, at the same time, our field of historical vision has been contracting, it has been tending to shrink within the narrow limits in time and space of the particular republic or kingdom of which each of us happens to be a citizen. The oldest surviving western states say France or England have so far had no more than a thousand years of continuous political existence, the largest existing western state say Brazil or the United States embraces only a very small fraction of the total inhabited surface of the earth. Before the widening of our horizon began before our western seamen circumnavigated the globe, and before our Western cosmogonists and geologists pushed out the bounds of our universe in both time and space our pre-nationalist medieval ancestors had a broader and juster historical vision than we have today. For them, 
history did not mean the history of one's own parochial community, it meant the history of Israel, Greece, and Rome. And, even if they were mistaken in believing that the world was created in 4004 BC, it is at any rate better to look as far back as 4004 BC than to look back no farther than the Declaration of Independence or the voyages of the Mayflower or Columbus or Hengist and Horsa. As a matter of fact, 4004 BC happens, though our ancestors did not know this, to be a quite important date, it approximately marks the first appearance of representatives of the species of human society called civilizations. Again, for our ancestors, Rome and Jerusalem meant much more than their own hometowns. When our Anglo-Saxon ancestors were converted to Roman Christianity at the end of the 6th century of the Christian era, they learned Latin, studied the treasures of sacred and profane literature to which a knowledge of the Latin language gives access, and went on pilgrimages to Rome and Jerusalem and this in an age when the difficulties and dangers of traveling were such as to make modem wartime traveling seem child's play. Our ancestors seem to have been big-minded, and this is a great intellectual virtue as well as a great moral one, for national histories are unintelligible within their own time limits and space limits. Two in the time dimension, you cannot understand the history of England if you begin only at the coming of the English to Britain, any better than you can understand the history of the United States if you begin only at the coming of the English to North America. In the space dimension, likewise, you cannot understand the history of a country if you cut its outlines out of the map of the world and rule out of consideration anything that has originated outside that particular country's frontiers. What are the epoch-making events in the national histories of the United States and the United Kingdom? Working back from the present towards the past, I should say they were the two world wars, the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Western voyages of discovery, the Renaissance, the conversion to Christianity. Now I defy anyone to tell the history of either the United States or the United Kingdom without making these events the cardinal ones, or to explain these events as local American or local English affairs. To explain these major events in the history of any Western country, the smallest unit that one can take into account is the whole of Western Christendom. By Western Christendom I mean the Roman Catholic and Protestant world the adherents of the Patriarchate of Rome who have maintained their allegiance to the papacy, together with the former adherents who have repudiated it. But the history of Western Christendom, too, is unintelligible within its own time limits and space limits. While Western Christendom is a much better unit than the United States or the United Kingdom or France for a historian to operate with, it too turns out, on inspection to be inadequate. In the time dimension, it goes back only to the close of the Dark Ages following the collapse of the western part of the Roman Empire, that is, it goes back less than 1,300 years, and 1,300 years is less than a quarter of the 6,000 years during which the species of society represented by Western Christendom has been in existence. Western Christendom is a civilization belonging to the third of the three generations of civilizations that there have been so far. In the space dimension, the narrowness of the limits of Western Christendom is still more striking. If you look at the physical map of the world as a whole, you will see that the small part of it which is dry land consists of a single continent Asia which has a number of peninsulas and off-lying islands. Now, what are the farthest limits to which Western Christendom has managed to expand? You will find them at Alaska and Chile on the west and at Finland and Dalmatia on the east. What lies between those four points is Western Christendom's domain at its widest. And what does that domain amount to? Just the tip of Asia's European peninsula, together with a couple of large islands. By these two large islands, I mean, of course, North and South America. Even if you add in the outlying and precarious footholds of the Western world in South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, its total habitable present area amounts to only a very minor part of the total habitable area of the surface of the planet. And you cannot understand the history of Western Christendom within its own geographical limits. Western Christendom is a product of Christianity, but Christianity did not arise in the Western world, it arose outside the bounds of Western Christendom, 
in a district that lies today within the domain of a different civilization. Islam We Western Christians did once try to capture from the Muslims the cradle of our religion in Palestine. If the Crusades had succeeded, Western Christendom would have slightly broadened its footing on the all-important Asiatic mainland. But the Crusades ended in failure. Western Christendom is merely one of five civilizations that survive in the world today, and these are merely five out of about 19 that one can identify as having come into existence since the first appearance of representatives of this species of society about 6,000 years ago. In to take the four other surviving civilizations first, if the firmness of a civilization's foothold on the continent by which I mean the solid land mass of Asia may be taken as giving a rough indication of that civilization's relative expectation of life, then the other four surviving civilizations are better lives in the jargon of the life insurance business than our own Western Christendom. Our sister civilization, Orthodox Christendom, straddles the continent from the Baltic to the Pacific and from the Mediterranean to the Arctic Ocean, it occupies the northern half of Asia and the eastern half of Asia's European peninsula. Russia overlooks the back doors of all the other civilizations, from White Russia and Northeastern Siberia she overlooks the Polish and Alaskan back doors of our own Western world, from the Caucasus and Central Asia she overlooks the back doors of the Islamic and Hindu worlds, from Central and Eastern Siberia she overlooks the back door of the Far Eastern world. Our half-sister civilization, Islam, also has a firm footing on the continent. The domain of Islam stretches from the heart of the Asiatic continent in northwestern China all the way to the west coast of Asia's African peninsula. At Dakar, the Islamic world commands the continental approaches to the straits that divide Asia's African peninsula from the island of South America. Islam also has a firm footing in Asia's Indian peninsula. As for the Hindu society and the Far Eastern society, it needs no demonstration to show that the 400 million Hindus and the 400 or 500 million Chinese have a firm foothold on the continent. But we must not exaggerate the importance of any of these surviving civilizations just because, at this moment, they happen to be survivors. If, instead of thinking in terms of expectation of life, we think in terms of achievement, a rough indication of relative achievement may be found in the giving of birth to individual souls that have con. Fared lasting blessings on the human race. Now who are the individuals who are the greatest benefactors of the living generation of mankind? I should say, Confucius and Lao Tse, the Buddha, the prophets of Israel and Judah, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Muhammad, and Socrates. And not one of these lasting benefactors of mankind happens to be a child of any of the five living civilizations. Confucius and Lao Tse were children of a now extinct Far Eastern civilization of an earlier generation, the Buddha was the child of a now extinct Indian civilization of an earlier generation. Hosea, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Muhammad were children of a now extinct Syrian civilization. Socrates was the child of a now extinct Greek civilization. Within the last 400 years, all the five surviving civilizations have been brought into contact with each other as a result of the enterprise of two of them, the expansion of Western Christendom from the tip of Asia's European peninsula over the ocean, and the expansion of Orthodox Christendom overland across the whole breadth of the Asiatic continent. The expansion of Western Christendom displays two special features, being oceanic, it is the only expansion of a civilization to date that has been literally worldwide in the sense of extending over the whole habitable portion of the Earth's surface, and, owing to the conquest of space and time by modern mechanical means, the spread of the network of Western material civilization has brought the different parts of the world into far closer physical contact than ever before. But, even in these points, the expansion of the Western civilization differs in degree only, and not in land, from the contemporary overland expansion of Russian Orthodox Christendom, and from similar expansions of other civilizations at earlier dates. There are earlier expansions that have made important contributions towards the present unification of mankind with its corollary, the unification of our vision of human history. 
the now extinct Syrian civilization was propagated to the Atlantic coasts of Asia's European and African peninsulas westward by the Phoenicians, to the tip of Asia's Indian peninsula southeastwards by the Hymerites and Nestorians, and to the Pacific northeastwards by the Manichaeans and Nestorians. It expanded in two directions overseas and in a third direction overland. Any visitor to Peking will have seen a striking monument of the Syrian civilization's overland cultural conquests. In the trilingual inscriptions of the Manchu dynasty of China at Peking, the Manchu and Mongol texts are inscribed in the Syriac form of our alphabet, not in Chinese characters. Other examples of the expansion of now extinct civilizations are the propagation of the Greek civilization overseas westwards to Marseilles by the Greeks themselves, overland northwards to the Rhine and Danube by the Romans, and overland eastwards to the interiors of India and China by the Macedonians, and the expansion of the Sumerian civilization in all directions overland from its cradle in Iraq. For as a result of these successive expansions of particular civilizations, the whole habitable world has now been unified into a single great society. The movement through which this process has been finally consummated is the modern expansion of Western Christendom. But we have to bear in mind, first, that this expansion of Western Christendom has merely completed the unification of the world and has not been the agency that has produced more than the last stage of the process, and, second, that, though the unification of the world has been finally achieved within a Western framework, the present Western ascendancy in the world is certain not to last. In a unified world, the 18 non-Western civilizations four of them living, 14 of them extinct will assuredly reassert their influence. And as, in the course of generations and centuries, a unified world gradually works its way toward an equilibrium between its diverse component cultures, the Western component will gradually be relegated to the modest place which is all that it can expect to retain in virtue of its intrinsic worth by calm. Parison with those other cultures surviving and extinct which the Western society, through its modern expansion, has brought into association with itself and with one another. History, seen in this perspective, makes, I feel, the following call upon historians of our generation and of the generations that will come after ours. If we are to pour, form the full service that we have the power to perform for our fellow human beings the important service of helping them to find their bearings in a unified world we must make the necessary effort of imagination and effort of will to break our way out of the prison walls of the local and short-lived histories of our own countries and our own cultures, and we must accustom ourselves to taking a synoptic view of history as a whole. Our first task is to perceive, and to present to other people, the history of all the known civilizations, surviving and extinct, as a unity. There are, I believe, two ways in which this can be done. One way is to study the encounters between civilizations, of which I have mentioned four outstanding examples. These encounters between civilizations are historically illuminating, not only because they bring a number of civilizations into a single focus of vision, but also because, out of encounters between civilizations, the higher religions have been born the worship, perhaps originally Sumerian, of the great mother and her son who suffers and dies and rises again, Judaism and Zoroastrianism, which sprang from an encounter between the Syrian and Babylonian civilizations, Christianity and Islam, which sprang from an encounter between the Syrian and Greek civilizations, the Mahayana form of Buddhism and Hinduism, which sprang from an encounter between the Indian and Greek civilizations. The future of mankind in this world if mankind is going to have a future in this world lies, I believe, with these higher religions that have appeared within the last 4,000 years, and all but the first within the last 3,000 years, and not with the civilizations whose encounters have provided opportunities for the higher religions to come to birth. A second way of studying the history of all the known civilizations as a unity is to make a comparative study of their individual histories, looking at them as so many representatives of one particular species of the genus human society. If we map out the principal phases in the histories of civilizations their births, growths, breakdowns and declines we can compare their experiences phase by phase, 
and by this method of study we shall perhaps be able to sort out their common experiences, which are specific, from their unique experiences, which are individual in this way. We may be able to work out a morphology of the species of society called civilizations. If, by the use of these two methods of study, we can arrive at a unified vision of history, we shall probably find that we need to make very far-going adjustments of the perspective in which the histories of diverse civilizations and peoples appear when looked at through our peculiar present-day Western spectacles. In setting out to adjust our perspective, we shall be wise, I suggest, to proceed simultaneously on two alternative assumptions. One of these alternatives is that the future of mankind may not, after all, be going to be catastrophic and that, even if the Second World War prove not to have been the last, we shall survive the rest of this batch of world wars as we survived the first two bouts, and shall eventually win our way out into calmer waters. The other possibility is that these first two world wars may be merely overtures to some supreme catastrophe that we are going to bring on ourselves. This second, more unpleasant, alternative has been made a very practical possibility by mankind's unfortunately having discovered how to tap atomic energy before we have succeeded in abolishing the institution of war. Those contradictions and paradoxes in the life of the world in our time, which I took as my starting point, also look like symptoms of serious social and spiritual sickness, and their existence which is one of the portentous features in the landscape of contemporary history is another indication that we ought to take the more unpleasant of our alternatives as a serious possibility, and not just as a bad joke. On either alternative, I suggest that we historians ought to concentrate our own attention and direct the attention of our listeners and readers upon the histories of those civilizations and peoples which, in the light of their past performances, seem likely, in a unified world, to come to the front in the long run in one or other of the alternative futures that may be lying in wait for mankind. v. If the future of mankind in a unified world is going to be on the whole a happy one, then I would prophesy that there is a future in the old world for the Chinese, and in the island of North America for the Tmadens. Whatever the future of mankind in North America, I feel pretty confident that these French-speaking Canadians, at any rate, will be there at the end of the story. On the assumption that the future of mankind is to be very catastrophic, I should have prophesied, even as lately as a few years ago, that whatever future we might be going to have would lie with the Tibetans and the Eskimos, because each of these peoples occupied, till quite lately, an unusually sheltered position. Sheltered means, of course, sheltered from the dangers arising from human folly and wickedness, not sheltered from the rigors of the physical environment. Mankind has been master of its physical environment, sufficiently for practical purposes, since the Middle Paleolithic Age, since that time, man's only dangers but these have been deadly dangers have come from man himself. But the homes of the Tibetans and the Eskimos are sheltered no longer, because we are on the point of managing to fly over the North Pole and over the Himalayas, and both northern Canada and Tibet would, I think, be likely to be theaters of a future Russo-American war. If mankind is going to run amok with atom bombs, I personally should look to the Negrito pygmies of Central Africa to salvage some fraction of the present heritage of mankind. Their eastern cousins in the Philippines and in the Malay Peninsula would probably perish with the rest of us, as they both live in what have now come to be dangerously exposed positions. The African Negritos are said by our anthropologists to have an unexpectedly pure and lofty conception of the nature of God and of God's relation to man. They might be able to give mankind a fresh start, and, though we should then have lost the achievements of the last 6,000 to 10,000 years, what are 10,000 years compared to the 600,000 or a million years for which the human race has already been in existence? The extreme possibility of catastrophe is that we might succeed in exterminating the whole human race, African Negritos, and all. On the evidence of the past history of life on this planet, even that is not entirely unlikely. After all, the reign of man on the earth, 
if we are right in thinking that man established his present ascendancy in the Middle Paleolithic Age, is so far only about 100,000 years old, and what is that compared to the 500 million or 800 million years during which life has been in existence on the surface of this planet? In the past, other forms of life have enjoyed reigns which have lasted for almost inconceivably longer periods and which yet at last have come to an end. There was a reign of the giant armored reptiles which may have lasted about 80 million years, say from about the year 130 million to the year 50 million before the present day. But the reptile's reign came to an end. Long before that perhaps 300 million years ago there was a reign of giant armored fishes creatures that had already accomplished the tremendous achievement of growing a movable lower jaw. But the reign of the fishes came to an end. The winged insects are believed to have come into existence about 250 million years ago. Perhaps the higher winged insects the social insects that have anticipated mankind in creating an institutional life are still waiting for their reign on earth to come lf the ants and bees were one day to acquire even that glimmer of intellectual understanding that man has possessed in his day, and if they were then to make their own shot at seeing history in perspective, they might see the advent of the mammals, and the brief reign of the human mammal, as almost irrelevant episodes, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. The challenge to us, in our generation, is to see to it that this interpretation of history shall not become the true one. 9. Russia's Byzantine heritage I if this were a sermon, not an essay, the inevitable text would be a famous line of Horace's, Naturum expellas furca, tamen usque recurrent, you may throw nature out with a pitchfork, but she will keep coming back. The present regime in Russia claims to have made a clean cut with Russia's past not, perhaps, in all minor externals, but at any rate in most things that matter. And the West has taken it from the Bolsheviks that they have done what they say. We have believed and trembled. Yet reflection suggests that it is not so easy to repudiate one's heritage. When we do try to repudiate the past, it has, as Horace knew, a sly way of coming back on us in a thinly disguised form. Some familiar examples may be ring the point home. In 1763 it looked as if the British conquest of Canada had revolutionized the political map of North America by putting an end to the partition of the continent which had followed from the competitive colonization of the St. Lawrence Valley by the French and the Atlantic seaboard. By the English, but the appearance of this revolutionary change turned out to be illusory. The two dominions that had been united in 1763 were sundered again in 1783. It is true that, in the once again divided continent, it was the St. Lawrence Valley, now, that was British, whereas it had been the Atlantic seaboard before. But this transposition of the British domain in North America was a minor variation compared to the re-emergence, after 20 years of unity, of the original division of the continent into two politically separate fractions. In a similar way, it looked as though the restoration of 1660 had revolutionized the religious life of England by reuniting an English Protestant church which had split before the close of the 16th century into an Episcopalian and a Presbyterian faction. Appearances, however, were illusory here again, for the 16th century breakaway from Episcopalianism reasserted itself in the 18th century in the emergence of the new Methodist type of nonconformity. In France, again, Roman Catholic Orthodoxy has been disappointed, time and again, of the hope that it had succeeded in re-establishing religious uniformity once and for all by suppressing a heresy. The Albigenses were suppressed, only to break out again as Huguenots. When the Huguenots were suppressed in their turn, they broke out again as Jansenists, who were the nearest thing to Calvinists that Roman Catholics could be. When the Jansenists were quashed they broke out again as Deists, and today the division of the French into a clerical and an anti-clerical faction still reproduces the 13th century division between Catholics and Adoptionists, or whatever the doctrine may have been that the Albigenses really held, in spite of repeated attempts, during the last seven centuries, to dragoon the French people into religious unity. In the light of these obvious historical illustrations of Horace's theme, 
let us try to look into the relation of present-day Russia to Russia's past. Marxism wears the appearance of being a new order in Russia because, like the new way of life introduced into Russia in an earlier chapter by Peter the Great, it came from the West. If these fits of westernization have been spontaneous, it might be plausible to present them as genuine new departures. But has Russia been westernizing herself voluntarily or under duress? On this point, the present writer's personal beliefs are as follows, for nearly a thousand years past, the Russians have, as he sees it, been members, not of our Western civilization, but of the Byzantine sister society, of the same Greco Roman parentage as ours, but a distinct and different civilization from our own, nevertheless. The Russian members of this Byzantine family have always put up a strong resistance against threats of being overwhelmed by our Western world, and they are keeping up this re resistance today. In order to save themselves from being conquered and forcibly assimilated by the West, they have repeatedly been constrained to make themselves masters of our Western technology. This tour de force has been achieved at least twice over in Russian history, first by Peter the Great, and then again by the Bolsheviks. The effort has had to be repeated, because Western technology has continued to advance. Peter the Great had to master the arts of the 17th century Western shipwright and drill sergeant. The Bolsheviks had to get even with our Western Industrial Revolution. And no sooner have they done that than the West gets ahead of Russia again. By discovering the know-how of the manufacture of the atom bomb. All this puts the Russians in a dilemma. In order to INVE themselves from being completely westernized by force, they have to westernize themselves partially, and in this they have to take the initiative if they are to make sure of both westernizing in time and of keeping the repugnant process within bounds. The fateful question is, of course, can one manage to adopt an alien civilization partially without being drawn on, step by step, into adopting it as a whole? We may feel our way towards an answer to this case. Shin by glancing back at the principal chapters in the history of Russia's relations with the West. In the West we have a notion that Russia is the aggressor, as indeed she has all the appearance of being when looked at through Western eyes. We think of her as the devourer of the lion's share in the 18th century partitions of Poland, as the oppressor of both Poland and Finland in the 19th century, and as the arch-aggressor in the post-war world of today. To Russian eyes, appearances are just the contrary. The Russians see themselves as the perpetual victims of aggression from the West, and, on a longer historical perspective, there is perhaps a greater justification than we might suppose for the Russian point of view. A detached investigator, if such could be found, might report that the Russians' 18th century successes against Sweden and Poland were counter-offensives, and that their gains in territory in these counter-offensives are less characteristic of the relations between Russia and the West than the Russian losses of territory to the West both be. For and after. The Varangians, who founded the first rudiments of a Russian state by seizing command of the navigable inland waterways and thereby establishing their domination over the primitive Slav populations in the hinterland, seem to have been Scandinavian barbarians who had been stirred up and set moving eastward as well as westward by the northward march of Western Christendom under Charles Magna. Their descendants in their home country were converted to Western Christianity and appeared, in their turn, over Russia's western horizon as the latter-day Swedes, heathens transformed into heretics without having been cured of being aggressors. Then again, in the 14th century, the best part of Russia's original domain almost the whole of White Russia and the Ukraine was shorn away from Russian Orthodox Christendom and annexed to Western Christendom through being conquered by the Lithuanians and the Poles. The 14th century Polish conquests of originally Russian ground in Galicia were not recovered by Russia till the last phase of the War of 1939-45. In the 17th century, Polish invaders penetrated the hitherto unconquered part of Russia as far as Moscow and were driven out only by a supreme effort on the Rus. Xi'an side, while the Swedes shut Russia off from the Baltic by annexing the whole east coast down to the northern limits of the Polish dominions. In 1812 Napoleon repeated the Pole's 17th-century exploit, and, 
after the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, blows from the west came raining down on Russia thick and fast. The Germans, invading her in the years 1915-18, overran the Ukraine and reached Transcaucasia. After the collapse of the Germans, it was the turn of the British, French, Americans, and Japanese to invade Russia from four different quarters in the years 1918-20. And then, in 1941, the GER. Man's return to the attack more formidable and more ruthless than ever. It is true that, during the 18th and 19th centuries, Russian armies also marched and fought on Western ground, but they came in always as allies of one Western power against another in some Western family quarrel. In the annals of the centuries-long warfare between the two Christendoms, it would seem to be the fact that the Russians have been the victims of aggression, and the Westerners the aggressors, more often than not. The Russians have incurred the hostility of the West through being obstinate adherents of an alien civilization, and, down to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, this Russian mark of the beast was the Byzantine civilization of Eastern Orthodox Christendom. The Russians embraced Eastern Orthodox Christianity at the end of the 10th century, and it is significant that this was a deliberate choice on their part. Alternatively they might have followed the example of either their southeastern neighbors, the Hazars, on the steppes, who had been converted in the 8th century to Judaism, or their eastern neighbors the white Bulgarians, down the Volga, who had been converted in the 10th century to Islam. In spite of these precedents, the Russians made their own distinctive choice by adopting the Eastern Orthodox Christianity of the Byzantine world, and, after the capture of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453 and the extinction of the last remnant of the East Roman Empire, the Principality of Moscow, which by then had become the rallying point of Russian Orthodox Christendom against both Muslims and Latins, self-consciously took over the Byzantine heritage from the Greeks. In 1472 the Grand Duke of Moscow, Ivan III, married Zoe Paleologos, a niece of the last Greek wearer, at Khan. Stantinople, of the East Roman Imperial Crown. In 1547 Ivan IV, the Terrible, had himself crowned Tsar or East Roman Emperor, and, though the office was vacant, his assumption of it was audacious, considering that, in the past, Russian princes had been ecclesiastical subjects of a metropolitan of Kiev or Moscow who had been a subordinate of the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople a prelate who, in his turn, was a political subject of the Greek emperor at Constantinople, whose style, title, and prerogative were now being assumed by the Muscovite Grand Duke Ivan. The last and decisive step was taken in 1589, when the reigning ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, now a servant of the Turks, was induced or coerced, during a visit to Moscow, to raise his former subordinate the Metropolitan of Moscow to the status of an independent patriarch. Though the Greek ecumenical patriarch has continued, down to this day, to be recognized as primus inter pares among the heads of the Orthodox churches which, though united in doctrine and liturgy, are independent of each either in government the Russian Orthodox Church, from the moment when its independence was conceded to it, became the most important of all. The Orthodox Church's de facto, since it was then by far the strongest in numbers and was also the only one that enjoyed the backing of a powerful sovereign state. From 1453 onwards Russia was the only Orthodox Christian country of any account that was not under Muslim rule, and the capture of Constantinople by the Turks was dramatically avenged by Ivan the Terrible when he captured Kazan from the Tatars a century later. This was another step in Russia's assumption of the Byzantine heritage, and Russia was not just being cast for this role by the blind working of impersonal historical forces. The Rus. Sins knew well what they were about, in the 16th century, the policy was expounded with arresting clarity and confidence in a celebrated passage of an open letter addressed to the Grand Duke Basil III of Moscow, whose reign intervened between those of the third and the fourth Ivan, by the monk Theophilus of Pieskov. The Church of Old Rome fell because of its heresy, the gates of the Second Rome, Constantinople, have been hewn down by the axes of the infidel Turks, but the Church of Moscow, the Church of the New Rome, shines brighter than the sun in the whole universe. 
Two Romes have fallen, but the third stands fast, a fourth there cannot be. In thus assuming the Byzantine heritage deliberately and self-consciously, the Russians were taking over, among other things, the traditional Byzantine attitude towards the West, and this has had a profound effect on Russia's own attitude towards the West, not only before the revolution of 1917 but after it. The Byzantine attitude towards the West is a simple one, and it ought not to be difficult for Westerners to understand. Indeed, we ought to be able to sympathize with it, because it springs from the same extravagantly improbable belief that we happen to hold about ourselves. We Franks, as the Byzantines and the Muslims call us, sincerely believe that we are the chosen heirs of Israel, Greece and Rome the heirs of the promise, with whom, in consequence, the future lies. We have not been shaken out of this belief by the recent geological and astronomical discoveries that have pushed out the bounds of our universe so immensely far in time as well as in space. From the primal nebula through the protozoan, and from the protozoan through primitive man, we stilly trace a divinely appointed genealogy which culminates teleologically in ourselves. The Byzantines do just THQ asterisk, same, except that they award themselves the improbable birthright that, on our Western scheme, is ours. The heirs of the promise, the people with the unique future, are not the Franks but the Byzantines so runs the Byzantine version of the myth. And this article of faith has, of course, one very practical corollary. When Byzantium and the West are at odds, Byzantium is always right and the West is always wrong. It will be evident that the sense of orthodoxy and sense of destiny, which have been taken over by the Russians from the Byzantine Greeks, are just as characteristic of the present communist regime in Russia as they were of the previous Eastern Orthodox Christian dispensation there. Marxism is, no doubt, a Western creed, but it is a Western creed which puts the Western civilization on the spot, and it was, therefore, possible for a 20th century Russian whose father had been a 19th century Slavophil and his grandfather a devout Eastern Orthodox Christian to become a devoted Marxian without being required to make any reorientation of his inherited attitude towards the West. For the Russian Marxian, Russian Slavophil and Russian Orthodox Christian alike, Russia is holy Russia, and the Western world of the Borgias and Queen Victoria, Smile Self-Help and Tammany Hall, is uniformly heretical, corrupt, and decadent. A creed which allows the Russian people to preserve this traditional Russian condemnation of the West intact, while at the same time serving the Russian government as an instrument for industrializing Russia in order to save her from being conquered by an already industrialized West, is one of those providentially convenient gifts of the gods that naturally fall into the lap of the chosen people. let us look a little further into this Byzantine heritage of Russia's which does not seem to have lost its hold on the Marxian Russia of today. When we turn back to the Greek first chapter of Byzantine history in Asia Minor and Constantinople in the early Middle Ages, what are our sister society's salient features? To stand out above the rest, the conviction, mentioned already, that Byzantium is always right, and the institution of the totalitarian state. The germ of the conviction of being always right first sprouted in the souls of the Greeks at a moment when, so far from feeling superior to the West, they were at a disadvantage that was intensely humiliating. After having made a mess of their political life for centuries, the Greeks at last had peace imposed on them by the Romans. For the Greeks, the Roman Empire was a necessity of life and, at the same time, an intolerable affront to their pride. This was, for them, a formidable psychological dilemma. They found their way out of it by making the Roman Empire a Greek affair. In the age of the Antonines, Greek men of letters took possession of the idea of the Roman Empire by presenting it as a practical realization of the ideal king. D.O.M. of Plato's philosopher king, while Greek men of action gained admission to the Roman public service. In the 4th century after Christ, the Roman Emperor Constantine planted his new Rome at Byzantium, on the site of an ancient Greek city. Constantinople was intended by its Latin-speaking founder to be as Latin as Rome itself, but by the time of Justinian, 
Only 200 years later, Byzantium had become Greek again though Justinian was a zealous champion of the Latin language that was his, as well as Constantine's, mother tongue. In the 5th century, the Roman Empire survived in its Greek and semi-Hellenized Oriental provinces when it collapsed in the West, including Italy itself. At the turn of the 6th and 7th centuries, in the time of Pope Gregory the Great, the Latin Old Rome was a derelict, neglected outpost of an empire of which the Greek New Rome was now the center and seat of power. Down to this day, if you ask a Greek peasant what he is, and he forgets for a moment that he was taught at school to say Hellene, he will tell you that he is Romaios, meaning a Greek-speaking Eastern Orthodox Christian subject of an ideally eternal Roman Empire with its capital. At Constantinople The use of the name Hellene to mean modern Greek is an archaistic revival, in popular usage since the 6th century of the Christian era, the antithesis between Roman, now meaning Greek-speaking adherent of the Orthodox Christian Church, and Hellene, meaning pagan, has replaced the classical antithesis between Hell, Lean, meaning civilized man, and barbarian. That may look like a revolutionary change, yet nature will keep coming back, for the one thing which, for the Greek, is of supreme importance has remained constant in spite of this change. The Greek is always right. So long as the pagan Greek culture is the hallmark of superiority, the Greek glories in being a Hellene. But when the tables are turned and Hellenism in its turn is cast out to become barbarism's bedfellow in the outer darkness, the Greek changes his tune and now proclaims himself a subject of the Chris. Tien Roman Empire Hellenism may lose caste, so long as the Greek does not. Having thus adroitly vindicated his title to be the true heir of the kingdom, whatever kingdom it might be, the Greek Orthodox Christian went on to put Latin Christendom on the spot. In the 9th century, the Greek ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, Photius, pointed out that the Western Christians had become schismatics. They had tampered with the creed. They had inserted an unauthorized filioque. Byzantium is always right, but she had a particular reason, at that moment, for putting Western Christendom in the wrong. Photius made his damaging theological discovery about the Latins during the first round of a political contest between Byzantine Christendom and Western Christendom in which Photius himself was a leading combatant. This contest, like that between the United States and the Soviet Union today, was for the allegiance of a political and ideological no man's island lying between the two rival powers. In the 9th century the heathen, who, during the wandering of the nations, had occupied southeastern Europe from the gates of Constantinople to the gates of Vienna, began to feel attracted by the Christian civilization of their neighbors. To which of the two Christendoms should they turn for light? To the Greek Orthodox Christendom of the Byzantines? Or to the Latin Catholic Christendom of the Franks? Prudence suggested approaching whichever of the two Christian powers was geographically the more remote and therefore politically the less dangerous, so the Moravian heathen, who were up against the Franks, turned to Constantinople, while the Bulgarian heathen, who were up against the Byzantines, turned to Rome as Greece and Turkey today, lying, as they do, on Russia's and not on America's threshold, have turned to Washington, not to Moscow. When once these overtures had been made and had not been rejected, the Competition between the W. West and Byzantium for the prize of southeastern Europe had begun, and the stakes were so high that the rivalry was almost bound to end in rupture. The crisis which Photius had brought to a head was unexpectedly postponed by the eruption of the Hungarians. When this fresh horde of heathen established itself astride the Danube towards the close of the 9th century, Eastern Orthodox Christendom and Catholic Christendom were opportunely insulated from one another again. But, Upon the conversion of the Hungarians to Western Christianity at the end of the 10th century, the quarrel between the rival Christendoms burst out again and quickly festered into the definitive schism of 1054. Thereafter, Byzantine pride suffered a terrible series of reverses. Frankish Christians from the West and Turkish Muslims from the East now fell upon the Byzantine world simultaneously. The interior of Russia, around Moscow, 
was the only part of Eastern Orthodox Christendom that did not eventually lose its political independence. The homelands of the Byzantine civilization in Asia Minor and the Balkan Peninsula were completely submerged, and, in the last phase of their discomfiture, on the eve of the second and final fall of Constantinople in 1453, the only freedom of maneuver that was left to the Greeks was to choose between two odious alien yokes. Faced with this grievous choice, the medieval Greek Orthodox Christians passionately rejected the yoke of their schismatic Western fellow Christians and with open eyes elected, as the lesser evil, the yoke of the Muslim Turks. They would rather behold in Constantinople the turban of Muhammad than the Pope's tiara or a cardinal's hat. The feelings that determined this significant choice are on record in works of literature. During the Middle Ages As today, the antipathy between the two rival heirs of Rome was mutual. Read the Lombard Bishop Lyotprand's report to the Saxon emperors Otto I and II of his diplomatic mission, in their service, to the Byzantine court of Constantinople in the year 968. If you were sensitive solely to the tone and temper, and momentarily forgot the date, you might fancy that the author was an American visitor to Moscow in any year since 1917. Read the Byzantine princess imperial and a calmness history of the reign of her father the Emperor Alexius, who had to cope with the First Crusade. You might fancy that the authoress was a cultivated 20th century French woman describing the invasion of Paris by a wave of Middle Western American tourists at least, that is what you might fancy till you lighted on her description of the crossbow, that deadly new weapon of which the Westerners, in spite of being always wrong, had inexplicably discovered the know-how. If only it had been discovered by the Byzantines, whose destiny is to be always right. This passage of Anacomna's history might be a Russian complaint in 1947. About America's monopoly of the atom bomb. Why did Byzantine Constantinople come to grief? And why? On the other hand, has Byzantine Moscow survived? The key to both these historical riddles is the Byzantine institution of the totalitarian state. Empires like the Roman or Chinese, which bestow peace for centuries on once war-ridden worlds, win so powerful a hold on the affections and imaginations of their subjects that these cannot imagine living without them, and, consequently, cannot believe that these supposedly indispensable institutions can ever really cease to exist. When the Roman Empire perished, neither contemporaries nor posterity acknowledged its demise, and, since their eyes refused to face the facts, they sought, at the first opportunity, to bring these facts into conformity with their fancy by conjuring the Roman Empire back into existence. In the 8th century of the Christian era, there were determined attempts to revive the Roman Empire in both East and West. In the West, Charlemagne's attempt was a fortunate failure, but the attempt made by Leo the Syrian at Constantinople, two generations earlier, was a fatal success. The crucial consequence of this successful establishment of a medieval East Roman Empire in the homelands of the Byzantine civilization was that the Eastern Orthodox Church fell back into subjection to the state. In the pagan Greco-Roman world, religion had been part and parcel of secular public life. Christianity, springing up without the Roman Empire's leave, defended its freedom at the price of outlawry and persecution. When the imperial government came to terms with the church, it seems to have expected that Christianity would slip into the dependent and subordinate position that an official paganism had previously occupied vis-a-vis the Roman state, and, in the Greek heart of the empire, where the empire continued to be a going concern for nearly three centuries after the conversion of Constantine, this expectation was more or less realized as witness what happened to St. John Chrysostom when he fell foul of the Empress Eudoxia, and to Pope Vigilius when he incurred the displeasure of the Emperor Justinian. Fortunately, however, for the Church, it was freed from its official cage by the empire's collapse. Even at Constantinople, the ecumenical patriarch Sergius dealt with the emperor Heraclius on equal terms in the supreme crisis of the 7th century, and in the west, where the empire had broken down to. Hundred years earlier and was never successfully restored, the church not only recovered its freedom but preserved it. In our western world, 
for the most part, the church has maintained its independence of the state and has sometimes even exercised an ascendancy over it. The modern free churches in Protestant countries and the medieval Catholic Church in a not yet divided Western Christendom are, alike, in the main line of our Western tradition, while the modern established churches in Protestant countries have been, on the whole, something exceptional in Western history. Moreover, even where the church has been resubjected to the secular power in a Western state, this unwestern relation between church and state has been tempered by the climate of ecclesiastical independence which has been prevalent in Western Christendom on the whole. In the Byzantine world, on the other hand, the successful re-establishment of the empire in the 8th century deprived the Eastern Orthodox Church of the freedom that she, too, had momentarily regained. She did not re-enter the prison house without a struggle. The battle went on for about 200 years, but it ended in the churches becoming virtually a department of the medieval East Roman state, and a state that has reduced the church to this position has thereby made itself totalitarian if our latter-day term totalitarian state means a state that has established its control over every side of the life of its subjects. The medieval Byzantine totalitarian state conjured up by the successful resuscitation, at Constantinople, of the Roman Empire had a disastrous effect on the development of the Byzantine civilization. It was an incubus that overshadowed, crushed, and stunted the society that had conjured it up. The rich potentialities of the Byzantine civilization, which the Byzantine state nipped in the bud, are revealed in flashes of originality that burst out in regions beyond the range of the East Roman Empire's effective power, or in centuries subsequent to the empire's demise, the spiritual genius of the 10th century Sicilian monk, Saint Nilus, who made a new Magna Graecia in Calabria. Out of Christian Greek refugees from his native island, or the artistic genius of the 16th century Cretan painter, Theodokopoulos, whom the West admires as El Greco. The peculiar institution of the Byzantine society not only blighted these brilliant capacities for creation, it brought the medieval Byzantine civilization itself to the premature downfall that has been mentioned above, by making it impossible for the Byzantine world to expand without precipitating a war to the death between the Greek apostles of Byzantine culture and their principal non-Greek proselytes. The subjection of the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople to the East Roman Emperor created an insoluble dilemma when a heathen prince embraced Eastern Orthodox Christianity. If the convert became the ecumenical patriarch's ecclesiastical subject he would be recognizing, by implication, the political sovereignty of the East Roman Emperor, which would be an intolerable consequence for the convert. On the other hand, if he vindicated his political independence by setting up a tame patriarch of his own, he would be claiming, by implication, to be the East Roman Emperor's peer, which would be an intolerable consequence for the Emperor. This dilemma did not worry the Russian convert prince, Vladimir, and his successors, because the remoteness of Russia from Constantinople made the theoretical political overlordship of the East Roman Emperor innocuous there. But it did worry. The princes of Bulgaria, whose dominions lay at the East Roman Empire's European threshold, and, when Bulgaria finally opted for Byzantium after a preliminary flirtation with Rome, there turned out not to be room for both a Greek Orthodox Christian East Roman Empire and a Slav Orthodox Christian Bulgaria in the same Byzantine world. The result was a Greco Bulgarian Hundred Years' War, which ended in the destruction of Bulgaria by the East Roman Empire in 1019 and which inflicted such deadly wounds on the victor that he succumbed, in his turn, to Frankish and Turkish attacks before the 11th century was over. Russia alone in the Byzantine world of the day was saved by her remoteness from being engulfed in this cataclysm, and thus it was the latest convert to Byzantine Christianity that survived to become the heir of the promise, the destiny which, as the Byzantines believe, is not our Western birthright, but theirs. Russia's life, however, has not been an easy one on the whole. Though she owed her survival in the early Middle Ages to a happy geographical accident, she has had, since then, as we have seen, to save herself by her own exertions. In the 13th century she was attacked on two fronts by the Tatars and the Lithuanians, 
as the Greek homelands of the Byzantine civilization had been attacked by the Turks and the Crusaders some 200 years before, and, though she eventually got the upper hand, once for all, over her adversaries on the east, she is still having to run her arduous race against the ever-advancing technological know-how of the Western world. In this long and grim struggle to preserve their independence, the Russians have sought salvation in the political institution that was the bane of the medieval Byzantine world. They felt that their one hope of survival lay in a ruthless concentration of political power and worked out for themselves a Russian version of the Byzantine totalitarian state. The Grand Duchy of Moscow was the laboratory of this political experiment, and Moscow's service, and reward, was the consolidation, under her rule, of a cluster of weak principalities into a single great power. This Muscovite political edifice has twice been given a new fagate first by Peter the Great and then again by Lenin but the essence of the structure has remained unaltered, and the Soviet Union of today, like the Grand Duchy of Moscow in the 14th century, reproduces the salient features of the medieval East Roman Empire. In this Byzantine totalitarian state, the Church may be Christian or Marxian so long as it submits to being the secular government's tool. The issue between Trotsky, who wanted to make the Soviet Union an instrument for furthering the cause of the Communist World Revolution, and Stalin, who wanted to make communism an instrument for furthering the interests of the Soviet Union, is the old issue on which battle was once joined between St. John Chrysostom and the Empress Eudoxia and between Theodore of Studium and the Emperor Constantine VI. In the modern, as in the medieval, Byzantine world the victory has fallen to the champion of the secular power in consistent contrast to the course of history in the West, where it was the ecclesiastical power that won the day in the trials of strength between Gregory VII and Henry IV and between Innocent IV and Frederick II. The Byzantine institution of the totalitarian state has not so far had the same fatal consequences for Russian Orthodox Christendom that it had in the homelands of the Byzantine civilization when it precipitated a war to the death between the medieval Greeks and Bulgars. But we do not know what effect this political heirloom in Russia's Byzantine heritage is going to have on Russia's fortunes now that she has to make the momentous choice between taking her place in a Western world or holding aloof and trying to build up an anti-Western counter-world of her own. We may guess that Russia's ultimate decision will be deeply influenced by the sense of orthodoxy and sense of destiny which she has also inherited from her Byzantine past. Under the hammer and sickle, as under the cross, Russia is still Holy Russia and Moscow still the Third Rome. T. Amen Usqui Rakune. 10. Islam, the West, and the Future in the Past, Islam and our Western